Perfect. And um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Elion from Camden Carers here to deliver the Cam uh, Carer Awareness Training. So um, I'm the GPN Hospital Development Worker here at Camden Carers, uh, a role funded by Better Care Fund. And I'll speak a bit more about my project in a moment. So this is what we will be covering. So we'll be talking about who we support and what we can offer. We will touch on some general statistics about carers and caring through um, the State of Caring report. We will talk about the benefits of supporting carers and the risks of not supporting carers. And then we'll talk about how you can identify and support carers. So who we support? We support adult carers, so that's 18 and above, who live, work or study in Camden or care for someone who lives and studies in Camden. So a person that's being cared for could be someone with learning disabilities or someone that's neurodiverse and requires that level of care. It could be someone that's older and frail, or it could be someone with mental health problems. So what do we offer? We offer a wide range of support. One of the supports includes pr practical advice and um, support and well-being support. So that can include uh, carers assessments or carers, what we refer to as carers conversations, or it could include um, support on our support and well-being line. It could also include counseling, um, support around health and well-being. So we do this through health and lifestyle consultations, which I'll touch on a bit in more detail in a bit and it also includes um, social activities um, where people can get together support groups either virtually or in person and do things outside of their caring role these are opportunities for personal development and engaging in social things carers might not do otherwise so i'll start by talking about the project I'm on. Um, that's the GPN Hospital Development Project. So this project has essentially been funded to support carers or support these healthcare settings, so GPs and hospitals, in better supporting and identifying carers. So we know that. Um, I want to speak. I just do it. Sorry. Um, we know that carers um, are quite highly identified in these settings. So t seven out of 10 carers are identified in these settings. So it's about making sure even more carers can be identified, but also those that are being identified can be linked into the support they are eligible to. So one of the ways we do this is by offering training like care awareness training, the one I'm doing now or something similar. And that's just to make sure staff members are equipped to identify carers and um, able to potentially signpost them if they have that opportunity. Um, it's also to identify and support carers in MDTs and virtual wards. So I attend MDTs and virtual wards. And these are essentially places where patients or likely people that require care are discussed uh, and the support and how they can be supported is discussed. And I try to, in these scenarios, identify a carer that hasn't been identified or potentially just pick up any carers we already have registered with us and prioritize them as someone we can reach out to and support. We also look at 
uh, the setting it itself and think about how that can best be used to support or identify carers. So this will include simple things like just ensuring the space has posters or essentially things that can be viewed by someone who might not know they are a carer and then that hopefully will result in that either self-identification or linking up to a service um, that they are in need for. Uh, it could include also streamlining of carer referrals. So we just, when we speak to an organization or GP or any um, organization that is likely to encounter carers, we just try to emphasize the ease in which they can refer someone. They All they need is the carer's consent and then they can send us a referral form. Um, Diane, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry, just um, a question in the chat, and I was actually thinking the same thing. Um, what's an MDT, please? So sorry, I should Thank have. Thank you. Specified. So sorry. So that um, means multidisciplinary team meeting. So it's essentially uh, the purpose of them is to get the medical side of things and then the social side of things. So organizations are essentially brought together to how to, to think about how best to meet a patient's needs. And then that will uh, quite often involve a carer and um, thinking about how they can be supported in order to meet the, the cared for health outcomes. Thank you for flagging that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just the streamlining again of um, referral pathways. Um, that can also be outreach on the GP's part. So we've we um, suggested an initiative that involved essentially um, having GPs reach out to all the carers they have registered and essentially letting them know that they they are entitled to um, our support essentially because we because we noticed a disparity or a difference a large difference between the carers we have registered that are also registered with that GP and the the carers uh, the total amount of carers they have registered at their GP so it's about thinking about really making sure all those carers are at least aware of the support they are entitled to and hopefully engaging with that support to to improve their health and well-being. We also developed and tailor content for different settings. So some GPs might have a, a particular population. Um, so we can tailor content and language based on that to ensure that the content is uh, culturally and um, in terms of language accessible to these groups. Carers conversations or what's um, kind of formally known as uh, carers or officially known as carers assessments. These are essentially opportunities to formalize um, a caring role, but also an opportunity for a carer to go into some detail about what their caring role entails and what can be done to support them with that. So once a carer's conversation is had, uh, their caring role and what it entails usually becomes really clear. And as a result of that, um, funding can be requested in order to make sure their well-being uh, is supported, but also they can be signposted within the organization to what should by then be clear uh, is, a, is a, um, a support or service they, they are in need for. So that can include counseling. It could include uh, focusing on their health through, through health, health and lifestyle consultations, or it could be engaging in, in more community-based support uh, as a result of isolation. So that can also be encouraged 
as a result of the carer's conversation. So this is the health and lifestyle consultations I was essentially referring to just now. It involves physical health checks, blood, which include blood pressure and body composition. Body composition is essentially um, weight and height. Um, and, and then that's kind of measured as um, the body mass index, which is just a general measure of some health risks that are potentially to occur if, if it's too high. Um, also lifestyle questions um, around diet, exercise, alcohol consumption, and smoking. Then it's uh, other screening um, things, health measures such as um, cancer screenings, if they are entitled to, or um, engaging with vaccine programs, um, questions around that potentially um when was the last time um a dental check was done when was the last time an eye test was done and these things and then also other things that are related to health and well-being so discussions around mental health and sleep and these health and lifestyle consultations are a really good opportunity to have the carer engage in in a non-clinical, non-medical setting with their health, carers are potentially reluctant to engage or f feel that it's a big step to go out and contact their GP or engage with health services. This can be potentially a stepping stone to focusing and ensuring that they get the, they take the steps to make sure their health needs are met. So a really good service. So just thinking about now the state of caring and what it means um, to be a carer or what outcomes um, occur as a result of caring. So 61% of carers said they needed more support to be able to look after their health and well-being. 78% of carers agreed they were worried about being unable to provide care in the future. 82% of carers said the impact of caring on their physical and mental health would be a challenge over the coming year, an increase from the previous year of 77%. Some more statistics here. So 22% said that caring had caused them injury. And then there are also the social and work-related uh, impacts of caring. So one in seven people in the workplace are juggling both work and care. So assumptions shouldn't be made that um, a person, for example, in full-time work is not necessarily caring. They could be, in fact, juggling these things together. Um, also regarding the demographic of carers, so people aged 46 to 65 were the largest age group to become unpaid carers. So 41% of people who became unpaid carers were in this age group. So that just goes to show that a large portion of carers is made up of within this group. So potentially, um, if you are an organization that's supporting someone within this age range, it's it's good to reflect on that. But of course, just identifying and flagging anything that's care related and then um, supporting them as a result is important. And we'll touch on that more a bit now. So what are the barriers to accessing support? Obviously, when engaging with a carer or with a service user in general, you, it's important to reflect on these barriers to think about how to overcome them. So people are not aware of their rights in some cases. So if someone's not aware that they are either eligible or have a right to, for example, a carer's conversation, then they're not going to actively go and seek it out. So it's important to potentially 
flag that or make uh, the service user aware of their entitlements. And that's something we do here at Camden Carers as well. There's a sense of duty attached to the caring role. So this sense of duty can mean that um, creating or seeking support outside of it can be challenging. But it's also the case that unfortunately being a carer can be often stigmatized and people as a result refuse to identify themselves as a carer as a result of this stigmatization. So thinking about stigma more broadly as well, there's also a stigma in general to accessing support. So the fact that support is being offered is generally a stigma in itself and uh, engaging with it is stigmatized. So then that stigma just prevents people from actively engaging in sport they might need, even though it's something essential for them. They could have had previous negative or discriminatory treatment in services. So as a result of that, trusting and engaging with the service once again can be challenging. There's also a potential lack of cultural competence and accessible information. So that's something that actively always needs to be engaged. Um, if it's the case that there's a language barrier or there's a cultural barrier that's not being addressed, then um, it's unlikely that the, the service user is going to engage with the service. So important to just try and make everything as culturally accessible and um, with regards to language as well, potentially any, any potential barriers to try and address there. So what are the benefits of supporting carers? So with regards to health outcomes and uh, healthcare settings in general, this can be even the case for um, engaging with other organizations in the third sector as well, but there's uh, a better opportunity to avoid a non-attendance. It's usually the case that depending on the cared force needs, it's the carer that's arranging a lot of these appointments or ensuring that um, things that support the cared for are, are being attended. And in some cases, actually supporting them physically to, to attend these um, sessions, appointments, whatever it happens to be. So if that's the case, um, if it's the case that the care is supported, then it can be the case that you would get adherence to um, particular engagement. There's also a better understanding of the patient or service user. So having them engaged in part of that support will inevitably lead to better engagement of the service user due to that level of understanding. It could be the case that, for example, with learning disabilities or mental illnesses or mental health, certain things need to be communicated in a certain way. And uh, it could be the case that the cared for can support with that. Um, it could also lead in um, reduction of care stress, having them as having them there part of the process, engaging with the support for the service user is something that supports them as well. This point is particularly um, or mostly focused on healthcare settings, but it could apply to um, the third sector as well, but it could be an opportunity to reduce the workload for staff. So having them there present and being supported could alleviate some of the more, let's say in some cases, what they refer to as challenging behavior or just have general adherence to um, the support that's, that's being offered. And, um, and this is for the carer. It allows them the opportunity to prioritize their own health and well-being. So if, if it is the case that the uh, cared for is engaging in something else, especially if they have high care needs and they are, they are able to be supported in a different environment, then it is 
the case that the cared for can uh, sorry the carer can have some respite and engage in their own health and well-being those are the benefits there are also risks to not supporting the carer so the carer as a result of the stress of their caring role can have the cared for essentially um, have safeguarding um, issues such as neglect or, or um, abuse of the cared for. And then it could be the other way around if, if they are unable to manage or support the person they are caring for, then they can, that can result in personal um, abuse or um, self neglect. So supporting the carer essentially uh, um, supports them in not um, allowing these things to happen, or there's at least, if these things are going to happen, then they can be raised to ensure that those things don't happen. And speaking of raising um, the alarm for safeguarding, uh, a carer can play an, an essential role if they are engaged with services such as ours in raising concerns for their cared for so this can be um relating to uh the care work uh care workers and their obligations and it could be um just what's going on with the cared for themselves so the cared for could be hoarding could be self-harming anything to do with um safeguarding they can essentially potentially identify that and then flag it and then um there can be um safeguards put into place to to prevent that so now as an organization thinking about what you can do to identify carers um it's important to think about firstly the challenges of identifying carers so a lot of carers they don't actually see themselves as carers um they could be a uh, a parent, a family member, just a neighbor doing their neighborly deeds. Um, it's just something they do. So because of that, it takes a long time for them to identify themselves as carers. So majority of case cases, uh, so over 50% of carers that identify as carers, it takes them over a year. The other third, it takes over three years. So that's a large proportion of carers essentially taking over from one to three years to identify themselves as carers. And if they're not identifying themselves as carers, it's unlikely that they are linked in to the support they are entitled to. So considering that, when can you identify a carer so it could be when you engage with them opportunistically it could be that you're having a conversation and someone's discussing challenges at home and they're clearly outlining what seem to be caring roles it could be life admin it could be essentially doing something for someone that clearly has care needs upon these discussions it's good to point out in an open way, considering that the individual might not be open to the term caring, to essentially inform them that they are entitled to support and they are, um, whether or not they want to take on that specific word of a carer, they, given what they do, they can be supported and they have, they are entitled to accessing that support. Thinking about how best to communicate that and then hopefully uh, have have a referral sent over ideally or if not that just leave them with some material that they can maybe mull over reflect on um, in the future it's also when concerns are raised so if someone is highlighting a concern uh, for someone that clearly has care needs then it, that could be the case that they are a carer 
And that's potentially something that, again, opportunistically could be uh, open to discussion if if um, if the opportunity is there. So in terms of feedback of what carers are telling us, and this is specifically for hospital settings, but I think some of this can be um, kind of translated or potentially applicable in, in other settings. So carers are saying that they aren't being recognized as carers. So when they go into the hospital, they just aren't identified. Um, Again, they acknowledged uh, the point I made earlier that people might not identify themselves as carers and therefore they don't know the support they're entitled to and um, don't know, don't recognize their caring role. There's also a lack of communication between professionals and a lack of consistency of how carers are treated. So a lot of carers identified that in some settings they were really considered and engaged with, whilst in others they were um, not engaged with and not supported. There's also a lack of communication or what they felt was a lack of communication. So they felt that they weren't involved uh, in the patient's care or in their cared for's care. They felt there was a lack of availability of resources, so leaflets and posters. This is something we're trying to address in the GP and hospital project. They also felt that they weren't being asked whether they are happy to provide care. And this is important. It's It should be known to the carer that they are making a choice when they do that and when they continue on with their care role and that it's ultimately something um, they choose to do rather they feel that they feel that they forced forced to do it and they should be made aware that it's their right to um, leave that caring role if that's something they choose to do. It's also the case that they felt that staff didn't know how to support them as carers so they weren't made aware of things they are entitled to, like carers' assessments. And it was the case that the people they spoke to didn't know that either. So again, this is something we we are hoping to address with this project and with the training we deliver to essentially outline that carers are entitled to support and carers' assessments are is part of that and one of the main things around that support. So how could you support carers? So probably given the feedback or what the carers have essentially outlined to us, you can pick up quite a bit of what support they might need. So information packs. So they, they mentioned that um, they felt that they didn't have the information they need. Since that's the case, information packs go a long way into to essentially address that and give them the information they might need. Could be the case that they feel so overwhelmed um, to engage with information packs, in which case um, they can contact us and we're more than happy to um, engage them, inform them in, in a way that's more accessible to them um, given their situation generally just linking them into our support is is ideal if not then the information pack is is appropriate um appointing a carer's champion so this this is a good point i think for all organizations if if an organization and statistically speaking i think is very likely for any organization to have at least one care carer in them no matter how small the organization is uh, to have a carer's champion, someone that can essentially be the point of contact or the liaise within the organization to say, to have that discussion, to say, for someone to feel comfortable enough to go to them to say, okay, there's this person that's a carer, what can we do for them? 
if it is the case that not everyone within the organization is um, really aware of what carers are entitled to or how to link them up to other support. So that's really useful. Generally, just using the space that service users access to have material where a carer can self-identify if, if it's the case that, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's the case that they haven't already identified themselves. Carers also acknowledged or identified that to be something they appreciate. And also collaborating with care organizations. Um, generally, we're very open to collaborating. There's a lot of projects and events we've de co-delivered and we've engaged with in the past and we are due to engage with. So reaching out to us you can contact us and and we'll be very happy to consider any any form of uh, co-working or collaborating with regards to events or other matters. So that's it. Uh, with regards, in terms of referring us, the details are here. So if you'd like to send a referral to us, that's referrals at camdencarers.org.uk. Um, or camdencarers at nhs.net if you want to take that route. Mm, and in terms of signposting, you can send out or give out our website. So that's camdencs.org.uk that has all the upcoming events or things we have to offer in general. Or you can just contact us on the number provided there, 020-742-88950. Yes, um, thank you. I think we finished considerably earlier than we expected to, but I'm happy to um, take any questions there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to stop you. this recording. Thank you.